Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to see what are the applications for understanding and computing what is the state of stress on a fault, what is its shear stress compared to its effective normal stress. We'll start looking at the concept of a critical stress fracture and what is the influence of that in on permeability. Let me walk you through um, through that through an example. We know that in uh, a fractured rock mass, like the one I'm drawing right now, I'm just going to draw a, plot, uh, a block here. But we're going to consider that this is a rock that it has a low rock matrix permeability, but because of the presence of fractures inside it, it might have a permeability which is different. So let me do several faults that cross this block. And here I'm just drawing what is the intersection of that fault with the side of the block uh, we can see. But uh, I hope you get the the general idea. Let me do one more fault. Uh, let's say somewhere there. All of these are planes which are cutting the fault. And because of the presence of these uh, fractures, we might expect that the permeability of this fractured rock mass is going to be increased. And that seems like obvious, like the presence of fractures uh, would increase permeability of the fractured rock mass. But then the question that you might have is, which is the fracture of this set that has the highest permeability? And that's exactly where we're going to get into, into the concept of critically stressed fractures. The idea here is to recognize, based on the state of stress, which is the orientation which is most favorable to have the highest permeability. And the concept of a critically stressed fracture postulates that this is going to depend on the state of stress. If we have a state of stress for which we have our three more circles that together make up the 3D more circle, you know that all the possible state of stresses are going to be within this region. Now, those are not going to be all the same because there are going to be some of those that are going to have a, a ratio of shear stress to effective normal stress, which is going to be different. So here in red, I'm drawing the shear failure for a friction coefficient, which some uncertainty of that uh, friction coefficient. So we know that in rocks, uh, rocks are very heterogeneous and the friction coefficient may not be one exact number, but that might vary. And that's what these two lines are representing. Okay. We say that a fracture is going to be critical stress when the ratio of the shear stress to the effective normal stress tends to a value which is close to the friction angle. And what this means is that the values that uh, fulfill these conditions are going to be values which are in this plot. Let me do it with, uh, uh, let me actually change this to uh, another color. So 
so I can make it. I, I want to make my my shear planes, uh, the ones, the critical stress in red. In blue. One more. Yes, blue. Okay, so the set of fractures of all these planes that here I just drew uh, uh, four, but imagine that we have many, the ones that fulfill with these conditions are going to be planes which are somewhere in this location. Those are going to be the points that have the maximum ratio of shear stress to effective normal stress. Other faults that may be located in a region like this, or there, or there, or even here, those are going to be a much lower lower value of the shear stress to effective normal stress. Notice that this just depends on the slope uh, between this point and the origin. The lower the slope of this line, then the smaller is going to be the ratio of shear to effective normal stress. The higher the slope between a given state of stress and, uh, and this horizontal line, that angle, the closer is going to, have to be to the friction uh, limit coefficient. And the general idea here is that as you get closer to this condition in which the shear stress to the effective ratio of shear st stress to effective normal stress approaches the friction coefficient, then that means that such fracture may be moving. And as it moves, that would mean that you are creating some damage in, the, in this fault, and this fault also, and this fracture may be dilating, which means uh, that moving in a direction opposite to the direction of the fracture. So imagine that uh, you have uh, big asperities in this fault as those asperities roll over the next asperity, your fracture would dilate. And what that would mean is that you will be creating a plane where fluids can go through. On the other hand, if you were to have a plane in which the shear stress is uh, very low compared to the effective normal stress, such plane like for example this plane, and let me make sure that that will be the continuation of that plane, this plane is going to have a huge stress because sigma 1 is the highest and it doesn't have any shear stress. So if it's not moving over time, uh, this fracture may even seal uh, because of precipitation of minerals uh, and because it's not moving at all, uh, that one will be expected to have a much lower permeability than, than the one that it's moving. So let me complete here the plot. This will be sigma 3, sigma 1, sigma 3, sigma 2. So the general idea here is that, again, the highest the ratio of the shear stress to the effective normal stress, the higher the permeability is going to be. So let's translate that to an equation, then the higher this ratio, the higher the permeability of the fracture. And if the fractures are the ones that define the permeability of your rock, then that means that the fractures that have the highest shear to effective normal stress ratio, those are going to have the highest permeability. And this is very important because notice that not all fractures, according to this condition, are going to have the same permeability. There are going to be some particular set of fractures that is going to have the highest permeability, and that's also going to yield a significant uh, permeability and isotropy. Let's see 
uh, why this is important. And uh, let's see some application cases. Here I have uh, two examples. The first example is an example of hydraulic fracturing. In this example, what you see are the trajectory of wellbores, horizontal wellbores. They get deviated around this location and they have different fracture stages. Each of these dots represents a micro seismic event. And that micro seismic event tells you that there was an event of shear failure at this location. So although we can see it, every single point in this image is telling you that there has been a particular uh, or th there has been shear failure at a particular location. The bigger the size of the dot, that means the bigger the displacement between the two planes, this displacement from here to there when the rock failed. And it's very important also to notice that when uh, this uh, shear factor reactivation happens, it is because uh, we're increasing the pore pressure and that pore pressure is making this more circle to move towards the left. And as this cir more circle moves towards the left, the region which is closest to the shear failure line is the one that is going to uh, to get uh, reactivated uh, first. So all of these points are uh, shear fracture reactivations and they reactivate at the particular orientation, which is the uh, orientation which is closer, up, is closer to the shear failure line. Okay, so don't worry if, uh, if there is a lot of information here, we're going to get back to this point when we talk about hydraulic fracturing. But just remember that a lot of this improved permeability in unconventional is given by the fact that you have reactivation or creation of some fractures in shear. All of those that are favoring the increase of permeability on the rock because of the mechanisms we, we talked about. Uh, about before, that these fractures are going to have a high ratio of shear to affect the normal stress, and that's going to favor the per to have a higher permeability in the fracture. Okay, so let's see uh, another example of how would we would apply uh, this condition of critical stress fracture, and how this is going to depend on the location of these faults in a 3D more circle. And in, in order to do that, I'm going to use an example of a student that took this class last year. And he was kind enough uh, to work on this project that uh, I assigned him in, in which uh, he had to do that optional problem of the 3D more circle. And he went even further and also did plot those, all of those faults in a stereo net projection. So here, if you want to get the, the particular code for that, just go to this uh, uh, HTML address, and you will find his code, which I'm going to show you in, uh, in one sec. Let's see what he did. Uh, basically, he coded the projection of the resolution of stress on a fault at an arbitrary orientation with the same equations that, that we saw uh, together. And then he created functions that uh, will capture all of that theory. And I created a few examples that will show how these uh, work. So let's see what he did in this first example. Uh, here we have an example of normal faulting where the minimum principal stress in this case is uh, 20, let's say, megapascals. The maximum principal stress is 45 megapascal, a pore pressure of 10 megapascal. 
and a friction coefficient of 0.6 with the minimum principal stress which is acting in direction north-south. If you build a 3D more circle for that, this is what you will get. Here you have the, the effective principal stresses, 10, 20, and 35. And in colors, what you see is the ratio of shear to effective normal stress. The closer you get towards this area, the hotter it gets, or the higher the the ratio of that effective uh, of that shear to effective normal stress, and the further away you get from this area, the cooler you are, and the lower is that ratio. Red areas then in this case are going to mean areas in which if you have a fracture of a fault, that will be expected to have high permeability. And let's see in this particular case, uh, he simulated the presence of 13 faults. That's right here, 13. And he also plotted that on a stereo net projection. So now in this stereo net projection, let me zoom out a little bit, we have also colored the stereo net with the color corresponding to the ratio of shear of, let me say that again, we have colored the stereo net with the ratio of shear stress to effective normal stress. So these red areas in here corresponds to faults or to locations that will correspond to that red area over there. So let's see as an example, these two dots represents these two faults over here and over there, which are close, not quiet at the maximum, but close to the red area. And what that means is that these faults that have a strike that it's more or less going in direction east-west and with a dip which approximates the 60 degrees, those are going to be the faults that are going to have the highest ratio of shear to effective normal stress. And will be those faults will be the ones that will have the highest permeability in this particular example. On the other hand, these faults over here, or some of those over there, those have a very small ratio of tau to sigma n. Let's pick this one, which is quite blue. Uh, that would be a fault, which in this one, this dot appears to be right here. It's a fault which has, in this case, a, a very uh, small dip. It's about zero degrees. Actually, it's about a, it, it's almost a, a vertical plane. And in this particular case, uh, that seems to be a fault that also has a very high effective normal stress, which in this case is close to 35. So in this particular example, uh, that would correspond to a, uh, I'm sorry, I, I said the vertical case, this is not, this is a horizontal, a horizontal plane, uh, which is perpendicular to the effective uh, normal stress sigma one or the vertical stress. That's why it's located in this region. But in this example, we see that very clearly. We see how uh, we might have faults within a, within the subsurface that may be close or not to this region of, of high ratio of tau over sigma n. And in summary, the higher this ratio, the higher the permeability that you, we may expect in a particular location. If you, will, if you want to check a little more uh, Daniel's code, he also did the example for reverse faulting. So now you can see that the regions that are in red are the ones in which the dip is closer to 30 degrees. That will correspond, let me come back to the, this is an example from the homework, that will correspond 
to faults that are oriented uh, in this direction within small deep a small deep those are going to be the red areas if you were to have in the south surface a false at a, this particular orientation then uh, the one that is going to be most likely to have a high permeability is going to be this one which in this plot it appears to be that one over there and you can do the same thing for a strike slip but now the areas or the faults with the highest a shear to effective normal stress are going to be located in this region. So you can see from this example that depending on the stress regime, the faults are going to have the highest permeability, they, they vary. The deep and strike is going to vary according to the particular stress regime and to the direction of the horizontal stresses. This is a very important application because it not only applies to hydraulic fracturing, but also applies to naturally fractured formations. Uh, in a case of a natural fracture formation that we, for example, we have enough natural fractures that we may not want to uh, do an additional uh, fracturing job, the orientation of those horizontal wellbores is going to be dictated by the orientation of the faults that you expect to have the highest permeability. In this particular example, I have a place in which I have natural fractures that are oriented in two characteristic sets. One set is the green one with a, with a high tau to sigma n ratio and are those fractures. And there is this other set of fractures which is oriented in this other orientation. The question is in which direction you would drill a wellbore in order to have the highest uh, connected uh, specific area of the fractures with the wellbore. Here you already have the solution and such wellbore should be drilled perpendicular to the direction of the, uh, the fractures that have the highest permeability. In this case, the highest permeability set is this one with a high tau to sigma n ratio. And we want to place a wellbore perpendicular to those because if I had a molecular fluid, let's say somewhere over here, that molecule of fluid will go directly into the natural fracture and go into the wellbore and then into the wellhead. And that's going to make it a lot easier for fluid to travel from the rock towards the wellbore. If we were to have a case, for example, of a wellbore that was drilled in the direction, uh, let's say this direction number one, which is parallel to the direction of the set of maximum permeability, uh, we might miss all those natural fractures. So for example, a fluid, the same case as before, that was somewhere over here, in order to get into the wellbore, it will have to go through the rock matrix uh, all this length in order to get there. But if the rock matrix has a very low permeability, that's going to, to take a long time. It's going to take much longer to go from here to there through the rock matrix than from here to there through a fracture, even though this length is higher than that length. And uh, even and if we had a molecule of fluid somewhere over there, it would be uh, a lot worse. It will, it will get a long time to go from here through the, uh, through the wellbore. So in this case, option number two would be the preferred option because that one is hitting the, naturally, the natural fractures uh, perpendicular to them and is taking advantage of that network of natural fractures in order to, uh, to be connected to the rock matrix. Okay, so this is one example, uh, another example of the application of uh, critical stress fractures. Uh, remember that this is very important for uh, reservoir engineering and for uh, capturing what is the set 
of uh, of fractures that is going to be the one that has the highest uh, permeability. This condition of critical stress fracture is particularly valid for brittle rocks, and uh, the the higher the brittleness of the rock, the the more important this mechanism is going to be, where again the permeability of the fracture is going to be proportional to tau over sigma n. Okay, this is one example of the application of stresses on fractures and how uh, we can use that in, for reservoir engineering in this case, in order to tell what is the permeability of a fractured rock. The second example is about the determination of horizontal stress, assuming that I'm at the limit of uh, equili a limit equilibrium or at the limit of the maximum stress that a fault can resist. If you remember, uh, we talked about tectonic stresses before, and we used those tectonic stresses to calculate horizontal stresses. We said that the higher the horizontal stress or the tectonic, in this case, uh, let's use, let's talk in terms of strain, the higher the tectonic strain, the higher the tectonic stress is going to be. And that that would be proportional to the jam modulus. And this is what I have in this drawing. So here we have a tectonic strain and the tectonic stress that, that would produce. The higher the tectonic strain, if I remain in elastic region, the higher that tectonic stress is going to be. But as you can imagine, this stress is not going to go forever high. Yes, it's going to depend on the tectonic strain, but at some point the rock might break. And when that breaks, that's going to determine what is the maximum value of stress that the subsurface can support laterally. And that maximum stress is going to depend on what is the frictional strength of such material. And, and here we are recalling the equation that we used before, in which we say that the maximum stress sigma 1 is going to be q times the value of sigma 3. Whenever we get into this, into this failure region, we are saying that the uh, brittle section of the aircraft is already failing. And that's why we have faults, that's why we have mountains, and that's why uh, we can apply this uh, particular uh, theory that the maximum stress is going to be limited by the frictional strength of the aircraft. And by assuming that the maximum value of sigma 1 is depending on the minimum value of sigma 3, I'm also assuming that in this brittle crust, I have enough faults that there are going to be always critically oriented planes that allow me to find what that orientation is. Just give me a sec, I don't know what's going on here. It's not, okay, there we go. Uh, here we're assuming in this case that we have faults in all directions so that there is one of those which is critical stress and is getting to the limit of sigma 1 equal to q times uh, sigma 3. And just uh, for you to remember a nice example of what I mean with a brittle crust, you should imagine the earth like a creme brulee. Next time you go to a restaurant, you try to get for a dessert a nice creme brulee, and the first thing that you do with your creme brulee is you break the crust. And let me find a nice picture about that. I, I think there was a good one at the beginning. So I cannot find a better one. I come back over there. Uh, no. So I think this, this is good enough. So you see that creme brulee over there. Uh, usually uh, you have sugar there and after 
uh, the sugar gets uh, caramelized, it gets brittle, and when you get with your spoon, you break it, and that's what you get. Well, the air crust is similar. We have a, a brittle crust made out of rocks that when we have tectonic stresses, they break. And how they break, and what is the maximum stress that they can support, is related to this equation in which the maximum value is Q times the minimum value. And this is going to be very useful because this can tell us what are the maximum and the minimum values for horizontal stresses, depending, of course, on what is the stress regime. Remember, we used before the equations of elasticity because we assumed that we were in this region in which the stress was proportional to the tectonic strain. But many times we're going to be outside this region and we may be already in the failure region. In that failure region, now it's this equation, the one that is going to be uh, the one that we apply. And let's see how we apply uh, this equation for a particular example. So uh, here I have uh, an example, problem 513. And here we're going to show how we use this equation to determine the value of horizontal stress in a particular location. OK, uh, first of all, uh, this is saying that I have a site onshore, which is subjected to normal forting stress regime. It's also telling me what the, the pore pressure is. It's hydrostatic. And the question is, what is the minimum horizontal stress at the given depth, assuming that this particular site is at the limit of frictional equilibrium with this friction angle? What this means is that I'm going to calculate the value of the effective horizontal stress, assuming that this is at failure, that sigma 1 is equal to Q sigma 3. Let's see how we would interpret this problem. This would be the interpretation. This is subjected to normal faulting. And because it's at the limit of equilibrium in the subsurface, I have now normal faults. Notice that these normal faults are somehow steep, and that's what we could expect in normal faulting uh, conditions. Uh, notice that the hanging wall is lower relatively uh, to the foot wall, and this is the case across these uh, two faults. And I'm asked to calculate what is the horizontal stress at 5,000 feet of depth, assuming that the stress is controlled by the faults. OK, so the first thing uh, I'm going to do here is, uh, like always, remember that in the workflow that we have been using before, the first thing that we do is to calculate the total vertical stress, which in this case, uh, assuming that the lithostatic gradient is 1 psi per foot, 1 psi per foot times 5,000, that's going to give us 5,000 psi. I knew that this was a place subject to hydrostatic stress, so I know the pore pressure. And since I know the pore pressure and the total vertical stress, I can tell what the effective vertical stress is. Because this is a place which is, which is at failure, that means that this equation is uh, going to hold, in which sigma 3, which in this case is sigma h mean, is going to be equal to sigma 1, which in this case is sigma v, divided by q. This is the same equation as saying that sigma 1 is equal to q sigma 3, but here we have solved for sigma 3, because in this case, this is the unknown, is uh, sigma 3. And uh, since I know what is sigma 1, because it's sigma v, and I calculate what is the value of q, in this case, q is going to be 1 plus the the sign of the friction angle divided 1 minus the sign of the friction angle. And if the friction angle is 30, the sign is going to be 0.5. So this is going to be 1 plus 0.5 divided 1 minus 
0.5, which is going to be equal to 3. And the answer is going to be, for this particular case, 945 PSI, the maximum principal stress divided by 3. Th this is something very important because it's telling you that if you have a sedimentary basin in which you have an extensional regime, which means that uh, notice that how these points are getting further apart from each other in horizontal direction as the faulting uh, continues, uh, this is not going to get ever to tension. There's a minimum value for that compressional strain, horizontal stress, and that's going to depend on the frictional capacity of the fault. In this case, the minimum possible value for sigma h mean is this value. Because if it is a bit lower than that, you will create a fault somewhere else. Here I have a, another application problem. In this case, is with uh, reverse faulting. Uh, now, uh, we know that this is under reverse uh, faulting re regime, that we also know what is uh, the, the depth and what is the pore pressure, given this overpressure parameter. The question is, what would be the maximum horizontal stress, assuming that the state of stress is also at the limit of frictional equilibrium. So again, what you would do, I'm not going to show you the solution step by step. You can take a look at here. But what you have to do is compute the total vertical stress. Then you compute the pore pressure. After you get that, you compute the effective vertical stress. In this case, opposite to the previous one, the effective vertical stress is going to be the least principal stress, you're going to be sigma 3. And in this case, you're going to be able to determine what is the value of sigma 1, which in this case is going to be sigma h max. And therefore, once you have the pore pressure, you can calculate the total maximum stress. In the case of reverse faulting, this theory of uh, limit equilibrium is going to allow us to calculate what is the maximum possible value of the horizontal stress. And this is a, a measurement which is very valuable because many times it's very difficult to measure in the field what is this maximum horizontal stress. We know that we can measure vertical stress uh, very well. We can also measure minimum horizontal stress in uh, normal faulting or strike slip re regime with hydraulic fracturing, but measuring horizontal maximum stress it's, it's quite difficult and this is one of the methods that you could use to determine what is the maximum value for uh, such stress. There is uh, one more uh, case for uh, this uh, application and that would be for uh, strike slip and in the case of a strike slip if you knew what is the value of the minimum horizontal stress uh, you could tell what is the value of the maximum horizontal stress. So just let me summarize that in here. This is the determination of stress using limit friction e equilibrium. And remember that always the main idea here is to use this equation in which the maximum principal stress is Q times the least principal stress. In the case of normal faulting, if we know what is the value of sigma v, we can determine what is the lowest value of the minimum horizontal stress. In the case of a strike slip, if we know what is sigma h mean, 
which uh, that's determined through hydraulic fracturing. We can determine what is the maximum value of sigma h max. And in the case of reverse folding, if we know what is the value of sigma v, we can determine what is the maximum value of also sigma h max. This is very useful because sometimes we, we do not know what those tectonic strains are. And uh, in many places, there are uh, a significant number of faults that also support the idea that uh, the state of stress is uh, determined by stress equilibrium of faults rather than by uh, tectonic strains. Tectonic strains may have uh, taken the system uh, up to this point, but after that, the state of stress may be controlled just by the faults that are continuously failing and continuously uh, sliding. So this is the equation that we have to use. So remember, the workflow is exactly the same as before, as the case of the elastic determination. But instead of using the elastic equations, now you use these equations to relate effective stresses. Remember, always start with total stresses, go to effective stresses, and then you add pore pressure in order to come back to total stresses. OK. A corollary of this uh, type of uh, determination of the maximum value of uh, horizontal stresses based on limit equilibrium is uh, we're going to skip this polygon. You, you can read a little bit more about that in my notes. But as I was saying before, a corollary of this uh, would be that if I knew what the direction of faults is at the particular side, I could tell what is the stress regime that causes such faults. And I could tell also what is the orientation of the horizontal stress at that particular moment. And here I have one example, uh, application example, that can tell you how that will work. What we have here is an image uh, that shows the top of an anticline formation. So this was obtained through seismic in a particular uh, reservoir in the Middle East. So in red, you see the top of the anticline. As you go into the cooler colors, uh, you go deeper. So this is the top of the anticline. This is the axis of the anticline. And what you see over here are uh, failure, uh, failure planes on that particular reservoir layer. So the, the change of color is uh, given by the, the changes, sudden changes in depth at these particular locations. So, so this line is telling you that here you have a fracture. Here you have another fracture, and so on. But I, I hope that you can also recognize from this particular example that you also have lines at another predominant set which are following now uh, my mouse. Here, there, there. So what this is telling you is that these faults appear to be related to the stresses that cause such faults and also the stresses that cause such anticline. Before to go to the faults, let's just think about the anticline. If the anticline is bending, uh, with this axis, which means that it is tipping in this direction towards mostly towards the west and this direction towards the east. That means that very likely the stress that caused such anticline was a horizontal stress that was in this direction, that was squeezing this anticline in direction 
uh, more or less east-west. It's not exactly east-west over here, but it's following the direction of, of my mouse. And it appears that, that these lines are also, this change of, of topography on the reservoir layer, are also related to the faults. And in this case, let, let me try to copy this image. And I'm going to paste it over here. Uh, here it is. I'm going to enlarge a little bit. And we're going to interpret now this particular image. So just from looking at the anticline, I suspect that there should be a stress in this direction that made this anticline to be like that. Let's now see uh, how we use these lines that represent faults in order to determine that this was actually the stress of the that caused the anticline. So if I follow the direction, uh, let me do it with another color. Uh, let me do it with blue looks good in this particular case. This is the set, I'm going to call it number one. Set number one. And I have another set, which, let me do it with, with pink. That's going to be the set number two. This is set number two. If this was caused by horizontal stresses, can you notice that this look like strike slip faults where this would be If I were to, to draw a top view of a block diagram, set number one would be like this, and set number two would go like that. And if that's the case, and if this is a strike slip, that means that these faults were caused by maximum principal stress to be in this direction, and minimum principal stress to be in this direction, and vertical stress to be perpendicular to this line. Uh, so probably I forgot to say, but this, this is a top view. So we're looking at the vertical direction uh, perpendicular to the plane that we're looking at. Uh, so from this analysis and from looking at the faults, uh, that here in this case I'm telling you where they are, you can get to know what is the state of stress that caused those faults. In this, this particular case, this is the solution. And if I were to uh, calculate or measure what is the angle of SH max, if this is the north, uh, the north, let's see, is somewhere over here. If the north is somewhere over there, then that means that this is going to be the azimuth of SH max, which it looks, if this is 90 degrees from that, it looks to be oriented more or less at 90, I would say 120, 125 degrees uh, from the north. So just from looking at uh, images from uh, seismic images, or sometimes from outcrops, you can tell what is the stress regime that cause uh, such fractures for such faults, and also uh, what is the orientation of those uh, principal stresses. And that's another application of uh, the, the determination of uh, stresses on faults. Let's go to the, I think it's the, the last application, uh, which is fault reactivation. We know that uh, 
many stresses currently in the subsurface now add at the condition which it is in equilibrium and which that means that if this is the initial condition this small circle in black that is uh, some somewhat far from failure or it might not be a failure if we increase the pore pressure we are going to change what is the effective stress condition on a particular site. Let me drag this to the right so I can write equations for that. We know that effective stress is defined as total stress minus uh, pore pressure and this will be in the uh, tensorial notation. For a particular uh, fracture plane or a fault plane where this is effective normal stress and parallel to it I have a shear stress the effective normal stress on the plane is going to be also related to the similar equation as the one we have before as the total normal stress minus the pore pressure. So if I were to keep this value of total stress more or less constant and I increase the value of the pore pressure, for example, as I'm injecting fluids into the subsurface, what that's going to cause is that effective normal stress is going to get reduced. And what that means in the Mohr circle is that this Mohr circle is going to, going to move to the left, to lower values of sigma n. So by increasing the pore pressure, this Mohr circle is going to be more likely to get into the shear failure line. And when do we increase the pore pressure in, um, in petroleum operations? Uh, we do it when we inject fluids. For example, when we inject water to do water flooding, or when we inject uh, uh, fracking water in order to do hydraulic fracturing, or sometimes when we get all of this water and we do not inject it in the same location, but we inject it in another formation through a disposal well into a permeable formation like this one. In all those cases, if I increase the pore pressure to a value which is high enough that takes the state of stress, and particularly the stresses on the fault, to failure, what is going to happen is that this fault is going to reactivate, and which that reactivation means is going to slip in shear uh, again. Probably it's moving very little right now, it's moving nothing. By changing pore pressure, uh, you could cause uh, this fault to, uh, to reactivate or to get to shear failure again. When that shear failure happens again, uh, sometimes this uh, may be uh, harmless, but some other times it may compromise the sealing capacity of the fault, or some other times it may generate also induce seismicity. Uh, in this example for a water uh, disposal well, uh, we have seen that injection of water uh, close to faults, in particular if that hits rock which is brittle, uh, like igneous rocks, that might be the cause for generation of uh, uh, induced seismicity that could be over the limits of what is acceptable. And that's because of the reactivation of the fault in shear, because we are increasing the pore pressure, we are lowering the effective normal stress, and what we are doing now is we are increasing this ratio of shear to effective normal stress, because this value of sigma n is getting smaller, so I'm getting closer. Uh, to shear failure.
And this is a very important uh, problem that we need to be aware of. And uh, I don't know if you're all familiar with the cases of uh, induced seismicity in Oklahoma because of uh, wastewater injection. And uh, that was caused by a injection of wastewater into, into wells that were not controlled very well, that were injected uh, 24 hours, uh, seven days a week. And because of that, uh, that was changing the state of stress, uh, particularly in, in deep rocks, that when they, those got to reactivate, uh, generated induced seismicity. Uh, I want to tell you that the, the good news is that now that is uh, under control, one of the tools that we use in order to control or to avoid that type of induced seismicity is by measuring seismicity or also micro seismicity. The same micro seismicity that is used for monitoring hydraulic fracturing and which we saw at the beginning of this lecture can also be used to map induced seismicity and micro seismicity in faults. So if that uh, reactivation gets over a limit, then uh, we can detect that and we can stop injection at uh, those places. Uh, I want to tell you that also in Texas, we have uh, particularly acted strongly on controlling induced seismicity. This is one example, and it involves uh, researchers from the University of Texas, which are uh, working into detecting and averting cases of uh, high induced seismicity due to uh, petroleum operations in uh, the state of Texas. And here, out of this place, if you're interested, I, you, you, can, uh, you can browse through it. I pulled one nice presentation that shows uh, what is the increase of earthquakes of magnitude larger than three in the state of Texas over time. And then you can see that more or less when uh, significant uh, hydraulic fracturing activity started and waste water injection started, uh, that number of earthquakes uh, increased. And uh, in this particular slide, there is not, no, there is not recent data, but uh, this is again, as I was saying before, uh, under control, control with in, induced seismicity. And also in this plot, you can see that the activity in, in Oklahoma was quite a bit larger than what we have in Texas. Uh, coming back to the issue of uh, hydraulic fracturing, I also want to tell you that there are some cases of hydraulic fracturing that have also caused uh, induced seismicity of magnitude larger than three. And these cases were uh, particularly sites in which faults uh, were not mapped to begin with and people uh, didn't know that they, they were injecting next to faults and those faults uh, were the ones that uh, reactivated. In most cases, the practice of hydraulic fracturing, it just um, uh, results in uh, seismicity, which is lower than magnitude zero. But sometimes if uh, that hits a fault, it might go into a larger seismicity. And I have one more example about this. Uh, it's about uh, uh, CO2 injection. Uh, there are some other fluids also we can get rid of in the subsurface, not only wastewater. But here I have one example uh, that was a case of CO2 injection in Illinois, in which they monitored a micro seismicity. And these are the these dots that, that you see, these clouds of dots that you see, are the locations of where that induced seismicity happened because of injection of CO2 in this uh, vertical well. And what you can see is that uh, after some period of injection, uh, they started to measure some micro seismicity. The location of the dots tells you more or less what the uh, location of the fault is. So here we see a very well-defined trend of that fault. 
and probably if, if I were to interpret that in three dimensions, I would, uh, let me pick here, purple, uh, this particular plane, I would interpret that that appears to be a fault, which is, I don't know in which direction it's dipping, but let's assume that is uh, dipping in this direction. So this is a strike, this is a dip, and all these induced seismicity dots come from such a plane. And, uh, and in this case also, it, it documents that uh, mapping uh, for reactivation is very important for uh, geological sequestration and storage of carbon dioxide because in these projects also uh, we don't want to compromise the stability of faults and the sealing capacity of faults. All right, so with this topic, uh, we finish the applications of uh, stresses and faults. And the next thing to cover would be application, uh, would be actually uh, examples and um, problems uh, that include uh, some of these applications.